Dear God, we come to you now and we just ask that you just allow us to hear your word that has been prepared for us, dear Lord. And we just ask that you just allow us to hear it and hear it for what it's worth and then allow us to ingest it and allow it to become a part of us as we go out and live as, as you live through us. Your word becomes our witness. And dear Lord, we just ask that you just um, speak to our nation. We lift up our leaders to you, dear Lord, and uh, we ask for uh, protection on them. We ask that you, uh, you grant them the knowledge and the wisdom that can only come from you, dear Lord. And today, dear Lord, we just ask for, for peace on our nation, peace on our communities, dear Lord. And it's the true peace, the true peace that only comes through Jesus Christ. And dear Lord, we hope that all things that we do here today is pleasing to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue our series on Jonah, and we've, uh, we've hit almost the, the entire first chapter, and we've talked about how Jonah was a uh, reluctant prophet in his calling, and there were a lot of reasons why he was reluctant for his calling. He had a great national pride for, the, uh, for his nation, um, the Israelite nation, and, and nation of Judah, and we know that uh, he, it, was in a, it was in a resurgence period. Their borders had been expanded to the original borders that um, were there when King David and, and King Solomon um, were on the throne. And they were experiencing um, a financial resurgence. They were uh, living with uh, wealth that they had never experienced before as a nation. And then their, their enemies um, um, were over in Nineveh. Um, they, were, they were on the, on the decline and they had been in a, a period of upheaval, of political unrest. Um, there had been a, uh, an outbreak of disease there that had hurt them. And at this time period, when there was a great national resurgence inside of the nation of Judah, Jonah is a prophet in that nation. He's being called to go preach to his enemies, his mortal enemies. And he doesn't understand. He, uh, he does, in all honesty, he does not want them to be saved. He, uh, he is reluctant to the point to where he jumps on a, on a ship. He actually pays the fare to ride um, as far to the other end of the known earth at that period as he could go. And we know that God was always there to, to block his path, to get him turned around, to accept the calling that God had placed into his life. And we know that the storm rose up. We know that uh, Jonah was um, found to be the one who caused the storm. And he asked for this, the, his fellow sailors to throw him overboard. And uh, that's where we're picking up today. And uh, we know, and I want to talk to you today about the deep. Um, that is how the Bible, uh, how it, uh, it, it illustrates where Jonah ends up. And I want to talk to you about your own personal deep. Um, because th as we've talked about, this is not just a story about a guy who gets swallowed by a fish. And I know that that's where most of the conversation uh, most of the commentary, most of the arguments take place in that, in, that, in, in that particular platform is talking about the fish, the ability that that happened, could it happen, could he live in there. So we're trying to push that away and, again, to focus on what the Bible really needs and speaks to us about, and that is about Jesus Christ. So even though we're in the Old Testament, this is a story about Jesus Christ. It's the, it's the pre-telling of Jesus Christ. It's setting the stage and in fact, Jesus Christ refers to the story of Jonah. And uh, we know that um, we will all be in our own place of deep at some point or another. And we can go there depending on your personality and how you respond to instructions. And, and uh, if, you know, um, I, I was a kid that didn't take, in, I, I had to fail as a kid. My, I, I didn't take wisdom. Um, it didn't come naturally to me. I had to, I had to go out and experience failure. And failure has been my greatest teaching and teacher, not because of uh, uh, that's, you know, that's the best way that it ever happens, but that's the way that I had to be taught because of my personality. So have a conversation with yourself this morning because we all end up in the deep. And what happens when you're in the deep is what we want to talk about, what we want to reflect on and concentrate on this morning. Because the, the process of where Jesus Christ was in the deep that is what we're actually here celebrating and, and, and worshiping this morning, is that Jesus Christ conquered the deep. So 
Jonah ends up in the deep. In fact, in, in, at the end, the last verse of the first chapter says, Now, the Lord, as we know, he, he was there at every stop trying to get Jonah to understand his calling, trying to get him to, to uh, accept that. And it says here that the Lord had prepared the storm. Even when the sailors were trying to row back into shore, we know that he was pushing them further and further out. And uh, we know that uh, here he is. The, the Bible tells us that he literally prepared a great fish, and he sent that fish at the right time to be right there at the right level. And when Jonah is voluntarily asked to be, ta- to be thrown and thrown into the water, as he hits the water and as he begins to sink, that fish is there. It's been prepared by the Lord to swallow Jonah. All right, And then it tells us that Jonah was there in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So this is where sometimes this story gets run off track and it gets into another rabbit hole. That's not where we're going with this, okay? So the discussion and the belief about whether or not you think a fish could swallow a man and that fish exists and that he could live there for three days and three nights, we don't want to get consumed with that argument and with that conversation because so many times that's where we end up spending all of our time and it, it misses the point about what's being taught to us here and what we can take away personally and what we're supposed to understand what's being, what's being said here, okay? So we know that the word that is used here when we go back, uh, oh, when we go back and it says that the fish to swallow Jonah, okay? This is the same word that's used a lot of times in the Old Testament. It's used in Jeremiah several times. The one I'm going to point out to you, it's there several times. I'll let you study that. Um, I, won't, I won't bore you with, with all the times that it's listed there, but it's listed several times in the Old Testament, and it's always used in this particular way, the word swallow. And it says that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had devoured me, had crushed me. This is, uh, this is the nation of, of Israel talking about going up against Nebuchadnezzar in war and how Nebuchadnezzar would come in and he would take them and he would bring them into captivity. And the Israelites ended up being slaves. And it says that he has swallowed me up like a monster. And that's what I want you to think about is that the very word that is used to describe what the fish did to Jonah is the same word that is described that happens to the Israelites many times throughout history as they are, and I'll use the word, as they are swallowed up into slavery and into captivity. Now that, that is a statement that we can spend the rest of our lives thinking about this. One point is that so many of us are in captivity. We have been swallowed up into our own little prison, our own personal little slavery, our own little personal captivity. And we have been swallowed up, and it comes in many fashions and in many ways. Nebuchadnezzar, whether it's Nebuchadnezzar or whether it's a great fish, is that we all end up spending time in the stomach of these great monsters that swallow us up. And most of the time, if not every time, we are the ones who bring this monster or bring this fish into our lives. So, where we want to start at this morning is that where Jonah ends up as he's trying, now, and, and, and this will hit home with a lot of us, as he's trying to flee his calling, as he's trying to run from God and get into the freedom away from the freedom of his calling. He doesn't want this calling in his life. So he's trying to run away from it into a freedom away from this calling. But as he runs in and away from his calling, he ends up being swallowed up into captivity. Now that's a statement that all of us can sit and ponder on because as we tend to run from the callings in our lives, as we tend to run from things that God has placed into our lives, and we try to experience and get to that place of our own personal freedom that we choose to want to have, we always seem to end up in some type of captivity in chains. And that song that they sang this morning, The Chain Breaker, that couldn't fit more perfect because so many of us are in chains, but yet it's our, it's the chains that we've put on ourselves because we've sought our own um, freedom away from God. All right. And then it says that Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the well, in the tomb, so to speak. And this is the statement as we begin to reflect, 
regardless of where you are in the Bible, it's always about Jesus Christ. And I told you, this is a foretelling about Jesus Christ. And when we talk about what's going on in the book of Jonah, Jesus Christ uses this as what's going to happen to him. But also it's a, it's a statement on where we are in this day and age presently. And here's what he's saying. And this is right out of Matthew 12. This is Jesus Christ. He's answering the, the, the people, the Pharisees, and they've asked, show us, if you're, if you're who you say you are, show us a sign. Prove to us. Right here and right now, prove to us. Show us some kind of great sign that you are who you say you are. All right? And then when that is projected towards Jesus Christ, this is what he uses our own humanity and, and our own uh, failings and our own lack of faith against us to answer the, that, that challenge. And this is what he says. And it says, Jesus answered him and he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. So here's, here's what is being said there is that for those of us who are asked to do things, too many times what we do is say, Okay, I know you're asking this of me, but I need you to prove it to me with some type of sign. And I've told you this before, that there's been a lot of times when I've asked, God, if this is really what you want me to do, make lightning strike right here, right now. Okay, and the truth of the matter is that if lightning were to strike right there and right now at the spot I asked him to do it, I would look up at God and say, okay, could you make it happen one more time so I'm sure? Because there had been so many signs that were shown to the people. How many more signs did they need to know that Jesus was the Son of God? And then here is the curse. Here's the curse that he talks about. And um, he says, uh, you know, with enlightenment comes more responsibility. In fact, the Bible says that those who are blessed, more is required of them. Because of the blessing and the enlightenment that we have, we can't claim ignorance that we shouldn't be doing what God's asking us to do because we are blessed and we are enlightened more than others. And so it works against us. And so it says that when Jonah was in the belly three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be there three days and three nights in the very belly of the earth. So there he is as he is taking what happened to Jonah and in the deep, in the transformation that is supposed to happen in the deep, and he's applying it to himself. Okay, and then he says, and this is what he's talking about, the, the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented just with the very preaching of Jonah. They didn't need a sign. They didn't need some great miracle. They just repented at the very preaching of Jonah. But sometimes those of us who claim to be so grounded in our faith, so grounded in our beliefs, we're the very ones that require the most from this world and we require the most from God to prove to us that he's asking us to do the things that he's asking us to do. And it's because of what Jesus said to the disciples so many times, oh, ye of little faith. And we sometimes like to think about what we would do, but in all practicality and in all actual living and practice, we tend to be short in our steps of faith. And then when we ask for faith, we're required in, in proof of our faith, and we receive that, then we don't like that we're asked to do more. Okay? So that's what's going on here. And then in the deep, let's, it, it, Jonah goes on in chapter 2, and it says, we got Jonah in the belly of that fish there. And it says that as he was in the belly of the fish, as he was starting to sink, that here he is, he is exactly where he's, taking himself. He is exactly where he's asked to be. When the storm was raging, he, he voluntarily gave up his life so that he could save the soldiers. Make the connection there between Jesus and us and what Jonah did for the sailors, all right? There's always that connection with Jesus Christ. And then here's the thing, Jonah is exactly where he is asked to be and where his trek to freedom has taken him and now as he's there, now he decides that he needs the Lord's help. Okay? Boy, that punches me in the face. I don't know if it throat punches you or not, but it, it just did me. And this is what he says, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. Yeah. And, and here's the statement. Sometimes our affliction is self-afflicted. We hurt ourselves more than anybody else 
I mean, the thoughts that we have, we dream, oh, it's just sometimes terrible what's going on in here. And it says that out of the belly of Sheol, I cried and you heard my voice. So let's just spend a few seconds here talking about what, what this word Sheol is, okay? Because this is used in the Bible several times. Sheol is a Hebrew word, and it's used a lot in the Old Testament, and it refers to what we now commonly call the grave, or actually where the people who pass through this life, where they go to inhabit and live. It's called the land of the dead, and they called it Sheol. So Sheol was believed to be um, empty of any kind of emotion. So it's just almost like zombies there. And there's no love, no hate. Um, there's no, no actual knowledge, no wisdom. Um, you don't work. You just kind of kind of exist. It's a horrible place. There's no emotion, no reason, no purpose, um, no hope. And this is what they believe Sheol was. And the, the inhabitants there were actually weak, and they were very frightened and trembling souls. And once they passed through their gates, there was never the hope that they would ever escape this place called Sheol. Now, this is where a lot of us are today. Because if you're honest with yourself, the world has beat us down and it has such negativity out there, and there's such hatred out there, <clears throat> and, excuse me, and there's such division out there, that right now it's, it's kind of tough to grab some type of thread of hope to say, yeah, woohoo, it's all going to work out. Because it seems like the next 10 minutes there's going to be something else terrible that happened, and something here, and there's people to blame, and people divide. It's just a terrible, just a terrible time in our history, if we're just honest with ourselves. And right now, some of us can be in the land and be living like what's described here, and we could be existing in a land of Sheol, okay? And in, in the Bible, there is a progression that happens in the description and in what the theology, as it transforms, as the coming Christ is coming in, on what is happening with the understanding and the theology associated with Sheol, and it says there in Psalms, what man can live and not die? And, and there's the statement is that we're all going to die unless we're caught up in the rapture. And it says there that what can deliver us from the power of the grave? So that was the argument at one time is that there seems to be no hope. And if you're not careful in the life that you're living today, you can end up proclaiming that we live in a land where there is no hope. And then we look at Ecclesiastes, and it says that their love, their hatred, their envy, their envy has perished. Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. And so now, as you start to believe what's being preached here is that there's no hope, then you drop into what's called depression, or we drop into a negativity or a pessimistic view of society, and it can affect our theology. It can affect the way that we live, the way that we associate with our brothers and sisters. Where we're supposed to show love, we now inhabit a land of Sheol where there is no love. In a land where we should be the living word of Jesus Christ that proclaims hope over the, all the nastiness of this life, we are now living like we're in the very belly of Sheol, where there is no hope. So you have to be careful on how the happenings and what's going on affects your very theology. And you can say, well, my theology sound. Well, theology is great until you have to put it into practice. And the things that happen in your life is evidence on what you truly are relying on as your theology. So if you're plugged into your theology, that should be shown in your life. There should be evidence of your theology. And too many times, there's evidence of what we don't want to be our theology. And then it says that before I go to the place which I shall return, the land of darkness and the land shadow of death. So now we're starting to see a, a ray of hope. And then I, Isaiah tells us that your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise well, how shall they arise? They will awake and sing, and they will do it because of the very hope and the very 
um, sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we see that throughout the Bible, there is this transformation that is happening. And it's the transformation of the theology of Sheol, which transforms because of the promise of Jesus Christ. All right? And it says that Jonah, for he keeps praying here. All right? So he's in the belly, and now he's crying out in hope. He's crying out because of his affliction. And regardless of how he got there, he feels afflicted. And then we've talked about too many times it's our own self-affliction. But now he's crying out. He's crying out, and this is, this is what he feels. These are his very thoughts. I mean, fear in, in, in all, all um, exit of hope will get you to speak very honestly. And then you can bear your honest soul. And this is what's going on in Jonah. And some of us can relate with this this morning. As he said, you cast me into the deep, the deep. And, and, and here's the thing. This for you cast me into the deep. Okay, that's not a hundred percent honest answer. He got a, he asked to be thrown into the deep because he was running from God. And so many times we end up being in a place we don't want to be. And if you're honest with yourself, you're there because you've gotten yourself there based on your decisions. But yet we're just like Jonah and we cry out, "It's your fault." It's like Adam. Life was going good till you brought Eve in. Then it all fell apart. I was doing good until you gave me the woman. And that, ever since then, we've been blaming each other when we always end up blaming God. And then it says, you, the deep is in the heart of the seas, floods surrounding me. Your billows, your waves passed over me. And then here is where so many times when you voluntarily run from your calling from God and what he's asking to do in your life, this is where you'll end up feeling that you're out of the sight of God. We sometimes get to a place and it's based on our decisions and uh, it's based on what's going on in our lives. And sometimes the very things that we, uh, that we do, we get there because of our decisions and the things that, that we get there because of we're running from the truth, we're running from the things that God's asking us to do. And it says... And I need you, to, I need you to, to step on this line here. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. All right, so let's, let's understand what this means. Okay. Um, the waters surround me, even my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds are wrapping around my head. I went down to the moorings, the very footings of the mountains. And you see that he is steadily declining, declining, declining. And the earth with its bars closed behind me officially in a prison of your own making, yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. So let's talk about what's happening here. When my soul fainted within me, I rem let, me let me go back here real quick. So it says that your holy temple, there is a, there is a, a, a discussion that Jesus has with the Pharisees, and he says that, uh, hey, um, I will tear down this temple and then in three days, I will build it back up. And the Pharisees look at him and say, it took 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to tear it down and then you're going to build it in three days. And Jesus is looking at him with an affirmative answer. And they don't understand that Jesus is referring to the temple, the holy temple, where now we find salvation, where now we find God is in the very body of Jesus Christ, which is sacrificed and risen on Easter weekend. And so now when we see that Jonah is crying out and he is looking again to your holy temple, what he's actually looking towards, and even though we're in the Old Testament, he's looking towards the promised Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we get to a place of the pit and in the deep, and we are in our own little prison, where we have to cry out to and where we look to is to the holy temple, and that holy temple is Jesus Christ. And when we feel like we're about to die and we cry out to the Lord, I need to tell you that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ, the love of God, not wars, not anything, not death, not anything can separate us from the love of God. And here it is that he is in a prison of his own making. He is sinking to the bottom of the mountains. And it says there that even though the, the bars are closing in behind me, 
and you study this story for yourself, okay, um, I personally think that Jonah died. That's just my own personal opinion, and, and God brought him back from the dead, okay? And you, you study it for yourself, and it says here that even when the bars of death and the bars of this prison and the bars of Sheol, the bars of the deep close in behind me, I lifted my voice up because there's not anything that can separate me from God. And he answered me and he brought me up from and he brought my life from the very pit, the very bottom, Sheol, the prison of my own making, because he is the Lord, my God. And it says there that when my soul fainted, I remembered the Lord and my prayer went up into your holy temple. All right. And this is where Jesus is talking. And it says that he would destroy the temple and build it in three days because he was referring to his body. Jesus Christ is the temple. He is the raised temple. And we now can find salvation in the Lord. Those who regard, worth, who, uh, regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. This is a very powerful sentence in this story. Too many times we put our faith into worthless idols. They are idols that are sometimes hard to distinguish and hard to identify that we have idols in our lives. But here's the thing. Anytime you place more faith in something than you place in God, that has just become an idol. You hear? I, I'm going to say that one more time because this, this can be applied individually, as a family, as a church, as a community, and as a nation. So I, I, need to, I need to say this one more time, okay? Anytime you place any, anytime you place more faith in anything in this world, more than you place faith in God, that thing became an idol because you've placed more importance on this than you did on God. And this is a list that never ends here in this world. And when you're honest with yourself, and you give yourself a, a very honest accounting of what's going on in your life, you'll realize that you've got some worthless idols in your life. And they come at the own sake of our mercy. And the mercy in this sentence is capitalized because guess who the mercy is? Jesus Christ. For I will sacrifice to you a voice of thanksgiving. We always pray in thanksgiving, thankful for the Lord. And we always reinforce our vows that salvation is found in the Lord and the Lord alone. And it says that the Lord answered Jonah at his time of need, just like he always answers us. And he brought him out of the deep, out of Sheol, out of his own prison. And it says that the fish, that the Lord God spoke to the fish and the fish understood God. And he went and he vomited Jonah onto the dry land. So what's the application here? Too many of us are in our own little prison. Too many of us end up in the belly of a whale, the belly of a giant fish. And we get there because of our own decisions, our own pride, our own misunderstanding, our own uh, convincing, our own justification. We get there because of us. Now here's, here is, here is the, the take home. What happens when you're in the deep for three days and three nights should be a transformation into a new regenerated life. You should come out of the deep regenerated, a new life, ready to go do the things that God is asking you to do because you have reaffirmed your vow to God. You understand and lift your voice up in thanksgiving to God for help. You have placed all of your hope and you have looked to the true temple, Jesus Christ, who is the very foundation and source of our salvation. And you have gotten rid of all those worthless idols that you've placed more trust and importance on than God. So you should come out of the deep in a better place than when you first received the calling that God placed into your life that we run from. 
And this is, this is the very story of Jesus Christ. We are broken people, and he sacrificed his life and spent three days in the deep for us, in our place. He went there willingly and experienced that. When God turned his, it's all there. God turned his face away out of his sight. It's all there. And he reemerges from the deep. And all of life is transformed forever and ever. So ask yourself this morning, are you currently in the deep? Is there a time when you can look to the true temple, cry out in thanksgiving to a God who will never leave you nor forsake you and will always be there? And when you get vomited, I'm just saying what the Bible says, when you get vomited out of the deep, are you a regenerated, reinvigorated, new life, ready to go pursue what God's placed in your life? If you will bow your heads, dear God, we come to you now. And dear God, we are thankful for all the many blessings that you've placed in our lives, dear Lord. And dear Lord, right now we are just coming to you with an with a understanding that some of us have gotten ourselves into the deep. Some of us are in a prison right now, dear God. Some of us are in chains. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're there because we've gotten ourselves there. And we need help. We need to cry out and look to the true temple, Jesus Christ. We need to look to you, the God of mercy, the God of love, who will never leave us nor forsake us, that we can't be separated from your love. And dear God, we just ask that you just come to us in our time of need, our self-affliction, dear Lord. We're, our heads are being wrapped with seaweed. Our, our very life is leaving us. Our last breath has been taken and we are struggling, struggling against the deep, dear Lord. We need help to be brought out of the deep. We need to be brought out as a nation We need to be brought out as Christians. We need to be brought out as individuals, as families, as a church, dear Lord. We need to be brought out. And we need your new life brought to us. And dear Lord, when we are brought out of that deep, then give us the courage, then give us the perseverance, the humility to go out and do what you're calling us to do. In Christ's name we pray, amen.